One of the things that has been a great blessing to my life was meeting Karen. As I desired to be married to a good Christian girl, I was in Palomina at a Christian meeting and began talking to Karen. I then there was a barbecue in Bashian at a friend's house and so I plucked up courage to ask Karen out for coffee, as you do. And through a mutual friend, a man called James Sloss, I asked Karen out and she said no. And so that was disappointing. But then, as the old adage says, a faint heart never won a fair lady. <laughs> so I met her again at a Christian meeting. And this time she came up to talk to me and as we, we talked, uh, we got on really well together and we began to contact Vanilla and we decided to go out on a date. Now Karen was working in Castlewell Christian Conference Centre at the time and so I travelled to Newcastle and her first date was in an Indian restaurant just across the way from Newcastle Centre. After the meal we went to the Lighthouse Lounge in the Sleeve Donner Hotel where we had coffee together and we got on really well together again. And so we had a number of dates and then June 2012 we decided we should go out together and so as we got to know each other better it was clear that the Lord was in this and we had a love for one another and so 3rd of April 2013 I decided I'm going to ask Karen to be my wife and I thought how should I do this? So I thought to myself about going to a beach and writing on the sand, will you marry me? And I thought, no, maybe not. And then I thought about going to Belfast Zoo, because Karen loves animals, and beside the penguin enclosure, asked, will you marry me? And I thought, maybe not. And then I thought about having a meal together, and then asking, will you marry me? And I thought, maybe not. So I wondered what I should do. And so we decided on that day, when Karen would come to the family home outside the village of Ahokal, I would invite her into the garden, and just as Adam met Eve in the Garden of Eden, <laughs> there in the garden, I got down on one knee and asked Karen, would she be my wife? And thankfully she said yes. I remember trying to put the ring on her finger, but putting it in the wrong finger in the wrong hand. I was so past myself. And so we got engaged on the 3rd of April, 2013. And then we got married on the 23rd of July, 16 weeks later. So it was a great day, and Reverend Brian Smith conducted the wedding. I'm so thankful to the Lord for bringing us together and for the amazing opportunity to serve Him together as a couple. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship here in First Jamar Presbyterian Church. You're very welcome as you tune in with us this morning, and especially on this St. Valentine's Day. And uh, we'll be thinking about the subject of God's love in just a moment or two's time, but I think the announcements really are as uh, was announced last week. We know that Sunday school met at half past ten this morning virtually, and the worksheets are there on the church website, and that will happen again next week and Bible class meets at 10.15 via Zoom. Please, if you haven't had the chance yet to check out the little video with regard to um, what the Bible class are doing, check it out and um, support them in their walk, their coast to coast as they raise awareness for the work of CEF. In fact, you know what? We'll just show the little video just now, just so you can see what they're doing. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Johnny um, and I am the leader of the Bible class here in First Jamara Presbyterian Church. Um, today I wanted to share a little bit um, with you about the exciting fundraiser that the young people from Bible class will be taking part in over the next four weeks. As you know, over lockdown we haven't been able to do very much, um, but one thing we have still been able to do is to walk. 
Um, and as you might also know, many of the young people from our church are involved with the work of CEF in Ireland. And so the young people thought it might be a good idea to walk um, for a purpose. Um, and so was born the Coast to Coast Lockdown Walk Challenge. The goal of this challenge is for the young people to, from Bible class to collectively walk the length of Ireland um, from the very north coast to the south coast. To put that into perspective, um, that is a total of 302 miles, um, or it's also the length of 4,600 full-size football pitches, or staggering 40,000 buses. Um, so over the next few weeks, we hope to also hear from CEF workers from across Ireland, um, who will share a little bit about what they do, um, and will also encourage the young people in their challenge. To support the young people on their challenge, um, the Coast to Coast Lockdown Walk Challenge, um, you can pray that as they get out on a bike and walk, um, that God will keep them safe on the roads as they do so. Um, but even more than that, um, you can support the young people financially. In the description of this video, hopefully that you should find a link to a Just Giving page um, where you can submit your donation online. Um, and if you can't do that, then alternatively you could give your donation to Scott or myself um, and we would be so so happy um, if you could do that. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. Um, keep your eyes peeled on Facebook um, and also on the church WhatsApp group um, to keep up to date with the challenge um, and how the young people are getting on. Um, so thank you again and see you soon. So thanks to Johnny and to the Bible class for what you're doing at this time. The rest of the organisations will meet as you've arranged. Thanks to the PW that met on Monday night past. We're looking forward to your service in a couple of weeks' time. And also it was good to get the young people together on Sunday night. And we hope to do that again in the next couple of weeks also. But we'll announce that and let you know whenever that's taking place. Prayer meeting will take place on Tuesday, just as always, via Zoom at 8pm. And this week we're being joined by someone from outside, Pepe Moreno, a pastor in La Mancha in central Spain. Uh, a friend of mine is joining us to share with us at our prayer meeting on Tuesday night. So you and Pepe and everyone are welcome as we meet together at eight o'clock as we think a little bit about the work of EMF in central Spain and what it's like to pastor during this time. I think those are all the announcements that I want to mention just at this stage. In the Johannine epistles near the end of scripture in 1 John chapter 4. Scripture records this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. We love because he first loved us. Amen. Well, as we think about what today is, 
And as we think about those words from 1 John chapter 4, our opening praise, uh, our praise items today will all reflect the theme of love. And so our first praise, taken from Psalm 23, the King of Love, we praise God. The King of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. Where streams of living water flow, my ransom sorely leadeth, and where the verdant pastures grow, with food celestial feedeth. Perverse and foolish oft I strayed, but yet in love he sought me, and on his shoulder gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. In death's dark veil I fear no will, with thee, dear Lord, beside me, thy rod and staff my comfort still, thy cross before to guide me. Thou spreadst a table in my sight, thy unction grace bestoweth, and oh, what transport of delight from thy pure chalice floweth. And so through all the length of days, thy goodness faileth never. Good Shepherd, may I sing thy praise within thy house forever. Well, last week I said in the service that if you were willing to take part in the services or to record yourself praying, please let me know. And I'm very grateful that Rebecca has agreed to pray in our service this morning. And not only, Rebecca, is it good to have you pray, but to have you joining with us from Stirling, where you're studying in Scotland. So thank you. Hello, good morning. I um, hope you're all keeping well as we're in yet another lockdown. Um, it's true, I am back in Stirling at the moment. I've been here maybe about two weeks now. Um, arrived safely with absolutely no problems. So um, let's just come together now and let's pray. Dear God, I want to thank you for yet another new day where we can meet virtually to worship and praise you for all that you've done through us in Jesus. I want to thank you. Although we cannot be in church together right now, we can still praise you for your goodness, um, even though we are separated currently in our own homes. Lord, I want to ask to see that infection rates uh, will soon be reducing and that situation in hospitals will ease for our NHS staff and our key workers who are still tirelessly uh, working on the front line. Lord, I pray that you'll keep your hand upon them as they still work for us, Lord. Um, Lord, I want to thank you for the advances in the vaccines at the moment. Um, I pray that it gives some reassurance to those who need it most um, and that it is a sign that we can soon see light at the end of this tunnel. Lord, I want to pray for you to still work through the people of First Tomorrow, Lord, as we still are confided in our homes, Lord. I pray that um, we can still continue to share the gospel, Lord, um, and reach new people even from our own living rooms, Lord. I pray that you will keep them all safe and healthy um, until we can meet again in person. I pray for all of these things in your name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, we're going to have your time just now. We're going to have the children's address, and then we're going to go straight through into the children's praise and then our offering piece. And the details for the offering and the, the giving at this time will appear on the screen Thank you to everybody who has been giving at this time. But just to say this, that if you have been giving via the details that will appear on the screen, 
please make sure that your name appears beside your giving. Or if you have given during this time and you haven't had your name beside it, um, or perhaps you're not a church member here and you've given, please speak to myself or to the treasurer so we'll be able to record it in, a, in a, an appropriate way for the financial reports. Thank you. So boys and girls, you find Johnny and I at our homeschool homework here again. And um, we've done all types of things, but uh, we're doing some what today? We're just doing a bit of maths, Scott. Right, um, a bit of maths. We would have... Well, I have, I have some problem solving here. What have you got? I, I have some maths problems as well. Um, right. Maybe we should, we should we try them together and see if we can work some of these out. Yes, because the problem is this. Although Johnny and I are in the same maths group at school, we don't do them in the same order. So sometimes I start at the back and work my way forwards, and you obviously start at the right side and work your way forwards. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple that we're stuck on. So you tell me yours. Yeah, so the first one says... David has five golf balls. He hits right. two into the river and loses one in the trees. How many does he have left? So he hits, he has five. five and he loses two in the river mm -hmm. and one in the trees. One in the trees. Okay. So he has two left. So he has two left, I reckon. Okay. The, Big question would be then, what does David do with the two that he's got left? Well, but, who knows? Um, so um, two, okay. Yeah, the next two. one, um, it says, Johnny bakes two chocolate cakes. He cuts each cake into six slices. Mm -hmm. If he has four slices all by himself and his sister has three slices, how many will be left? Wow, okay. So I feel like I've got to draw this one out. Yeah, there's a lot so going on there. Two cakes. Yeah. And, and six slices each. Six in each. He's, okay. he's cut them into sixes. And it says that he has four slices himself, so he obviously likes his chocolate cake. So he, he has four. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Okay. And his sister has... Three. Three. Yeah. There's not much chocolate cake left, sure there's no, not. No, there's not. Hopefully there's well, no other sisters. That's a, that's or a full cake gone. I, know about, I mean, if Johnny had more than one sister, the cake would be well and truly eaten. But I make one, two, three, four, five. Five I slices. Make that five slices left. Okay. Well, I mean, that's very good. I mean, we know that during lockdown, lots of people have been baking mm -hmm. stuff over this. Have you baked anything over lockdown? No, well, uh, I made a cheesecake, so I did, to be okay. fair, uh -huh. um, which wasn't very successful. Um, but it wasn't a bad first attempt. Good. Um, so the last one on my page, it says, there are five chairs around a table. Tess, that must be a dog maybe, is it? Um, choose three quarters of the total number of legs. How many legs aren't chewed? Okay, so let's do this again. So what is it, how many? There's, there's five chairs, presumably with four legs. Five chairs around a table. Yeah. And they each have four legs. Mm-hmm. And Tess choose three quarters of the legs. And okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. There's twenty legs. Okay. So to make three quarters, we divide by four, multiply by three. That sounds great, Scott. I'm Isn't that right? You're here, yep. Isn't that right? That sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So five times three equals fifteen. Did you do maths for A level, Scott? Just for a few days. Just for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So that's 15 yeah. are chewed. But the question says how many aren't chewed. So that would be what then? So that would be 20 take away 15. I wonder if the boys and girls, do you know what 20 take away 15 would be? Is it, would it be five, Scott? In my head, I reckon so. Great. Okay, that's my page done. Um, have you got any, yes. what's your question? So I have one that I'm stuck on. And it's this. Peter earns fifty pounds in his part-time job. He goes to buy an expensive hoodie at forty-eight pounds. He realizes he's one pound short because he lost some money in church. How much did he lose? So he's one pound short of forty-eight. Yes. Which must mean he has forty-seven pounds. So if he had fifty pounds at the start, then. 
He's lost three pounds, is that right? That's right. He has lost, I have down here, he has lost three pounds. And, and where did it say he lost it? Well, it says he lost the money in church. Right. So. That's quite convenient, isn't it? It's quite convenient that we find ourselves here doing our homework in church. Do you think we so can maybe... there's potentially three pound lying around here. Three pound that Norman knows nothing about. <laughs> well, will we have a look for it, do you think? I mean, when we go for our walks, we normally buy a wee coffee and... Three pound would definitely buy pound, a flat white. Three pound would definitely buy us a coffee each. So, yeah. what do you think? Do you think, should we have a look around? I wonder, is there anything we could use to help us find it? Can you think? Well, you're the scientist, so uh, do you, can you think of anything that would help us in our quest to finding this three pounds? Well, the, co the coins will be made out of metal, so maybe if we had metal detectors. Maybe. Do you have a metal detector lying around? Funny you should mention it, Scott. Um, I actually do. Now, this is a bit of a, an improvised metal detector, uh -huh. as you can see. Um, so I have my phone, which is cell taped to um, a wooden stick. And basically, I have on my phone an app which helps us to detect metal. And I see you've got your and selfie funny stick. Funny enough, you told me to download the same <laughs> app. So I have my metal detector here as well. And I'm just not quite as agricultural as you. So <laughs> I have my selfie stick here <laughs> with it on. Um, yeah. So. Will we have a go trying to find these coins then? We'll have a go and see if we can find this Great. money. Okay, right, so we're all set. We're about to go coin hunting. And for those of you who are worried at home, we're still our two meters apart. Um, my stick and Johnny's stick keeps us well well apart as we go on our search. So we're, what do we do? Just hold our phones to the ground and go for a general sweep? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if there's any technique to it. You're the historian, Scott, so um, I know historians use metal detectors. Well, they do, that's right. And we were thinking a little, a little bit about that last week. We could have done with the metal detector to see if it was going digging last week. Yeah, well, that's very true, isn't it? Uh-huh. You find anything? Oh, oh, listen. Do you hear that, boys and girls? Sounds good. It's a bit strange. Scott, let me just see. Oh, wow. It's a the first missing coin. coin. Wow, where was it? It was sort of in the way into the pulpit. That's a bit strange, isn't it? What was somebody else doing in the pulpit? Well, you'll have to find that out for yourself. But to find that I've got out. the first coin. Well, maybe have a wee competition, Scott, will we? That's right. We'll look and see if we can find any more. Okay, right. Well, I'm going to sw sweep around here because you know, the person that lost it might have been around the piano or microphones. Yes, that's a good point, actually. Hmm. Oh, 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 oh. Let's oh, that. that sounds like a real hit there. Wow, and look at that. Oh, one pound. Scott. That's one each then. That's we're, one we're each. Drawing so far. That's it, right? Our so, our uh, our weapons are drawn. Now do we find the last one? Yeah, there's one more to find. Now, I wonder where else he would have been. And obviously, Scott, I'm at a slight disadvantage because the technology I have isn't quite. Um, as good as the technology that you have. Well, no. Don't know about that now. Yeah. Oh. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, I, th I think I, I got I th the beep first there, well, did I? Well, maybe so, but we just, both of our phones are beeping there, aren't do, they? Do you want to reach down, Scott? No, you reach down there. Sure? If, if, you, if your beep was first, you know, I wouldn't want to deprive you of... I'll just pull it out there. And there it is. There we have it. So I have one. And I have two. I and can't you, find the other one. It's in my you, pocket. You already have it in your pocket, Johnny. Okay. <laughs> yes. So there we are. There are the three coins, just as the, as the problem suggested. So boys and girls, I'm glad that we were able to find that money. Yeah. And um, obviously, what, I mean, Peter's lost it. Do we give it to Peter or um, do we spend it ourselves? What do you think, boys and girls? Do you think we should tell Peter? Hopefully Ruby's not watching or I else. know that. Maybe you'll find out. But. <clears throat> There's a parable in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 15, and it's about a lost coin. <clears throat> oh, what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, 
she calls together all her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And you know, Johnny, and boys and girls as well, God's Word tells us a story. So, Jesus is speaking in parables in the New Testament. We've been thinking about those for the last few weeks. And a parable is an everyday story used by Jesus to teach about the kingdom of God. And Jesus is teaching us here that in the same way, a lady who has 10 coins, and she loses one. And in Bible times, a coin is worth a lot of money. So, she's lost quite a bit of money when she loses her one coin. But she sweeps the house until she finds it, and there's great rejoicing over this one coin being found. And boys and girls, that's just like us. When we are found, when we are saved, when we trust in Jesus, and when He saves us, that's just like we've been found. And the Bible tells us that when we're found, there's a great party the angels in heaven sing and they rejoice. So, in the same way that the lady rejoices over finding her coin, Jesus and the angels and all of heaven rejoices when one person puts their faith and their trust in Jesus. So, isn't that good news, Johnny? That is great, isn't it? It's, it's hard good to, to believe. That... It's good to think about that, isn't it? That yeah. right now, you and I, there was once a day when all of heaven rejoiced when we became Christians. That's great, isn't it? And so actually, boys and girls, the thing is this. Really, the question is this. <clears throat> Will there be a party? Will there be rejoicing in heaven over you, realizing that you need to trust in Jesus? John 3, 6, For God so loved the world that he gave one and only Son, God, so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. But whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. That whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life.
So we're going to continue now as we uh, carry on from where we left off last Lord's Day, as we've been thinking about the character Elijah. Last week we finished with 1 Kings 18 and verse 40, and the, the prophets of, of Baal and um, Asherah have been taken to the river, and they have been slain for their, their practice and for their um, leading of the nation into apostasy. And so we take up the account then in 1 Kings 18 and verse 41. And as we read, we remind ourselves that this is the word of God. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again, seven times. And at the seventh time he said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So ends the reading of Holy Scripture. So we, last week, left off atop Mount Carmel, and the great contest had taken place, and the fire fell. Um, indeed, the fire fell and consumed all that was in its path, apart from Elijah, who was spared. And so this week, as we think of the land of Israel that has been um, parched of rain for three and a half years, now the Lord sends rain. And there's heavens sound, heavens closed, and heavens opened. One this morning and two this evening. Let's read from verse 41. So after all has happened, and Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the rushing of rain. Here we meet Ahab and Elijah again. There's been a great journey. Um, Elijah has been told to hide from Ahab by the brook Cherith. He's been told to make his way to Zarephath. He has been protected and hemmed in, where then he leaves the widow of Zarephath and heads towards Carmel, where he meets Ahab and Obadiah, and then the great contest has taken place atop the mountain. And during this whole time, during his time by the brook, and during his journey to Zarephath of 100 miles, and during his lengthy time in Zarephath, and then from Zarephath to Mount Carmel, that period of three and a half years has been a period when the land of Israel has gone without rain. Three and a half years of drought. And it's hard for us to picture here in this part of the world. And maybe there are days when you think to yourself, it would be wonderful if there would be such a time without rain. But three and a half years without a drop. Think of as you enter into Northern Ireland from the sky, and you haven't been able to do that for a while, I know, but um, the time is coming whenever, I know um, Ryanair have been told to take down their slogan, Jab and Go, but uh, it'll not be long before you'll be able to go again and return. And when you come back over Ireland and Northern Ireland, the first thing that always hits you is how green it is. Um, especially if you've been in Spain or you've been in Greece or Italy or some of the Mediterranean countries perhaps on holiday. You notice the vivaciousness and the, the verdancy of the green fields that we have. And three and a half years without rain would completely destroy that, even our green fields. This has also been three and a half years of, if you like, theological study for Elijah as he 
begins to um, come to Mount Carmel. Um, when you're training to be a minister in the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, you, you study, you do uh, about a half a year before you enter college, and then three years of college. Um, and I don't think that the, the people who put together the program for study necessarily have in mind the Elijah story. But three and a half years, Elijah has gone through, if you like, theological education, spending time with God, relying on God, um, seeping himself in God's word. And last week, well, when the fire fell, that was the climax, wasn't it? The Ahab and the false prophets, Elijah and the few followers of Jehovah and the masses, the crowd. Who is God? And both Elijah and God, Elijah for his lifestyle and for his message, and God for his position, have both been vindicated. And the false have been cut off. They've been killed. And what happens? Well, we read it, didn't we? There's prostration. The people, the crowd, the masses, they fall. As the fire fell, Ahab watched his system fall. His man-made system of idolatry fell and crumbled and was a mess right before his very eyes. His man-made system crumbled, just like the um, if you've ever played the game Jenga and you pull out the wrong piece, the whole lot comes tumbling down. Ahab's man-made system comes to nothing. Prophets are killed. The sword has fallen on all 450 prophets of Baal and all 400 prophets of Asherah. And imagine perhaps Ahab, here as we enter verse 41, perhaps Ahab thinks, I am the king I allowed this. I set this up. My consort, my wife, is a, a proponent of Asherah. I'm next. The prophets have been killed. The messengers have been slain. Perhaps I am next. How could it fall on them and not on me? For after all, Elijah has pointed at me and said that I am truly the troubler of Israel. What's the response, do you think? What is the fitting response? I will repent. I've seen the demonstration of Jehovah. I've watched as Yahweh, the covenant-keeping Lord and God, has acted. This is divine. This is sovereignty. This is power at its magnificence. I will repent. I will seek pardon. This is what's expected, isn't it? But no. If you like, Ahab is true to form. As 1 Kings 16 told us, he is the worst of all the kings of Israel. He is the worst. Look at verse 41. The fire has just fallen. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go up eat and drink, for there is the sound of the rushing of rain. This is a surprising statement, do you not think? Especially from Elijah. It's amazing, isn't it? You deserve to perish. And straight after all of this, what does he do? He eats and drinks. He has his lunch. Or actually this is the fire would have fallen after 3 p.m. So this is his evening meal. Either afternoon tea or his evening meal. Perhaps one of his servants brings him some refreshment. Strange, isn't it? Don't we see the mercy of God? The goodness of God should break Ahab's heart. I accused you of being the troubler. I've accused you of your sin, Elijah could have said, but no. And then verse 42 tells us, so Ahab went up and he ate and he drank. In some ways, as we see Ahab, what do we see? We see how dead. We see how blind. 
we see how wretched and did we see how deprived is the heart of man the new testament tells us that we are dead in our trespasses and sins the image almost of the unsaved is that we are like zombies the walking dead And isn't it wonderful that Paul says in Romans, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet dead, while we were yet walking corpses, Christ died for us. Ahab has just witnessed a miracle, hasn't he? It's not every day you watch fire fall from above. Not only did it fall, but it fell on the sacrifice, on the altar, on the ditch, on the the water, it licked up the very dust of the ground. What a powerful demonstration. Elijah standing right beside it, not a hair on his head has been singed. He's witnessed a miracle, the slaying of the prophets, and he sits back, and he eats and he drinks, and he rides away. He has destroyed Israel. He has destroyed the land. And is this not a point where we, right now, where we search our own hearts? Because are we any different? Are we any different? The reality is this, isn't it? That sinners are dying here. Sinners are dying in Canaan. Sinners are dying in Dramara. Sinners are dying in our homes, perhaps, even this morning. When I go home, um, now before lockdown, I normally would have went to visit my parents once a week. One of my mother's favorite activities is to get out the Balamina Guardian or the Balamina Times and to lay it out on the floor and she will begin then to analyse who has died. And I haven't lived at home since the age of 18, so every week I still get the so-and-so has died. And I have to always say, I don't have a, a notion who this person is. She goes, you do know. You knew their granny or you knew their, their, their son or their daughter. And although perhaps you're not getting the newspaper as often, what you do see now more often is funeral directors putting up death notices onto their Facebook pages and onto the internet. And so we still have the deaths page. We still have deaths appearing on Facebook and on Undertaker's pages at this time. And what we see here is that people are still entering eternity. Even the number of deaths that are still shooting up day by day And although the the number of daily deaths of COVID in Northern Ireland has come down, the number of cases is still shockingly high. There is death. But isn't it interesting that every week, every Sunday, every Sunday at half past 11, And at 6.45, the fire falls. The fire falls here. We see it. We see wondrous things. We behold wondrous things from God's word. And we see fire fall from the word. And in some ways, many of us, we then go home and we eat and we drink. In fact, we don't even go home. We just turn off the TV or switch off the screen. Maybe we're even sitting at the same table watching this service, and in 10 minutes' time, we'll move the screen aside, the little laptop or the iPad, and the dinner will come forward. There's obviously nothing wrong. It's right to eat your meal at your table and in your home. But there's this connotation, isn't there? That when the fire falls... 
when the Word of God is explained and revealed, and when there's majesty in it, and when there's authority, and whenever there's truth, it's almost like once the preaching is over, let's get about the business now of, instead of we've filled our souls, but let's just now fill our bellies and forget all about what we've heard. And what happens is, God comes here in Genesis, or in 1 Kings 18, He comes in judgment. The fire falls on the sacrifice. There is judgment. And then there's goodness and mercy. I wonder, are we similar to Ahab in this story? Maybe you look at this story, and maybe you think, look at Ahab. What an idiot. Think of what you've just beheld, what you've just seen and observed. The truth is this, if you are living this morning without Christ, then you're living the exact same life. It's the exact same for you. Does it not make you sad? This return home. Does it not make you feel sad for those who, when we're open as normal, for those who come here week by week and they just return home? Sunday by Sunday, with no repentance, without seeking his face. Ahab, in love this morning, repent. Message after message, warning after warning, goodness and mercy after goodness and mercy. We're all walking towards eternity. But are you walking to eternity without God? Why did Elijah say it? Well, I'm convinced that Elijah said this to Ahab because he knew Ahab wouldn't repent. Because it's almost sarcastic. We've already seen a little bit of Elijah's sarcasm. Last week, when he pointed his finger over at the gods or over at the prophets dancing around the little idols, he said, maybe your God is musing himself. Maybe your God is on a journey. Maybe your God is tired and he's having a wee sleep. I think he's doing the same here. You've seen all that you've seen, Ahab. Sure, go home, eat and drink. And he does. If you're so hard, do it. And he does. Thomas Watson, a Puritan from a former time, says this Dreaded is the man who goes loaded with sermons to hell. Indeed, dreaded is the man who goes loaded with sermons to hell. But what else does Elijah say? It's interesting here. Elijah says there is the sound of rushing of rain. A few lessons here as we begin to close. When a nation, when a church, when a family, or indeed when a person outwardly bows and says, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. God outwardly blesses. There's three and a half years here with no rain, it has been miserable. Imagine it. And now they bow. They say, the Lord, he is God. They've watched the fire fall. And now they say, the Lord, he is God. And God sends rain. The very same day they bow, outward repentance can produce outward blessing. Why? Because God is good. Do we ever wonder why we don't see such blessing nationally, locally, ecclesiastically, familiarly, personally? And 
ability to the lessons here on there. Firstly. Secondly, God's people inwardly bow. And there's inward blessing on their souls. It happens for Elijah, doesn't it? Believer, and I think you'll know what I'm saying here. When you bow before God, you know what I mean? You experience inward blessing. Where you would never, that you would never give up. Elijah, this time, can look back and say, Zarephath was all worth it. The journey heretofore was all worth it. The, the, the seclusion at Cherif was all worth it. It's beautiful to be a child of God, spiritually, because in surrender lies victory. Through difficulty, we're brought to bow before God, and he brings showers of blessing. There's victory here. There is outward, there is inward. What else do we see here? Ahab did not hear the rain, but Elijah did. What does he say? There's a sound. Was it physical? Or perhaps did Elijah hear with the ear of faith? The sky is bright blue. There's not a cloud in the sky. There hasn't been for three and a half years. So how did he hear? Well, yes, I do suggest that at this point, Elijah hears with the ear of faith. Hearing what the physical did not hear. And that's what faith is, isn't it? Faith forsaking all, I trust him. Hebrews chapter 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. I think he hears before the rain comes. Another sign of victory. Before it even comes. Even before it comes, there's thanksgiving. It's not interesting that this time, maybe we need ears to hear. After all we have learnt, from 2020 and into 2021, after all that we have learnt by being separated from one another, of not being able to eat around the table, of not being able to sing together with the gusto we normally do, of not being able to have last year our usual Easter services, all of the fellowship and organisations that we haven't been able to have as normal. Indeed, would God not grant us ears to hear what he is trying to say to us personally and us, his church, through all of this? That should be our prayer. Give us ears, Lord, to hear what you are saying. What are you saying? Verse 43. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. He said, go again seven times. There is nothing. Not only was it just a, a once, but go again, go again, go again, go again, go again, go again, go again. Seven times. My faith is in God, Elijah is saying here, and it cannot be wrong. Why? Because Elijah doesn't have any credit for the rain. Yes, he too, Elijah must understand that he offers nothing and God offers everything. And don't we learn in the waiting? Right now, in the nothing, often faith works. We see walking by faith, don't we, and not by sight. In Hebrew culture, to plant your face between your knees is a symbol of great humility. And that's where we leave Elijah this morning as we prepare to come to him again this evening. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. And we thank you, O oh Father, that... Your word is precious, it is perfect, 
that it speaks. And even this story can speak to us so starkly in the 21st century, so starkly during days of pandemic, so starkly during days of perhaps national apostasy. And in it, we see that we need to have ears to hear what you're saying to your church and to your people. May we not get tied up with the minutiae, Lord, but may we see your great overarching plan, that you're good, that you're God. We want to see Jesus and realize this morning that if we're not trusting in him, then as we leave, we're like Ahab, having seen the fire fall, and we just go home and eat and drink and be merry. And yet the scriptures tell us, go home, eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow you die. May our lives be worth more than that. May we realize that you are good, that you are God, and that you are king. Hear us as we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our closing prayers. together. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.